we're primarily viewing it through the lens of A lenders and like credit unions, right? There's always a private lender out there that can lend to us as long as we've got equity. Of course, yeah, no, as, as long as you have equity, there's always a private lender, alternative lender out there who's going to allow you to do those specific strategies. Mm -hmm. But from an A lender's perspective or a credit union lender's perspective, it's all about risk mitigation, yeah. right? And that's a lot of risk that they're not willing to take. And unfortunately, they have a hard stop for the majority of those uh, investment solutions. What is up YouTube, Matt McKeever here, and in today's video, we're gonna be discussing exactly what do your lenders want when it comes to your leases. I know a lot of real estate investors have frustrations around this subject matter because they think, I, I've had a tenant living here for three years, how would that be a bad thing? And then when it comes time to get their financing, their lender's like, we need a tenant acknowledgement, or we need a new lease, or we need this, that, and the other. So today, the guys from Finlay, Josh and Aaron, are going to demystify this entire process around what lenders want when it comes to your leases. Let's jump into it. What is up, YouTube? Matt McKeever here, and I'm really excited for today's video because one, we've got Josh and Aaron from the Finlay team back, but today we're going to be specifically talking about lenders and leases. And so I know that this is both kind of a mystery box for some investors as well as a point of frustration sometimes when I've got my property rented out, what more do you want from me? But it turns out sometimes just having a person living there isn't enough. You need some documentation. For sure, yeah, no, we, we, we found that we run into a handful of different situations where um, there's leases that are either in place or expired and people are always wondering about how can I use those leases or how can I use my rental income to help me qualify. So we thought we'd make a video explaining what lenders are looking for in a lease and how we can use them. Mm -hmm, absolutely. So, I mean, the timing of your lease can obviously come into play, um, you know, for example, and we're going to touch on this in a little bit, but, you know, if your lease hasn't come into place yet, or maybe that lease is, uh, you know, potentially going to expire in the middle of a transaction, um, how do the lenders move forward and are you still able to use that lease and, and what uh, kind of strategies do we have? So, um, starting off, we're going to start off with leases for the subject property. So, just for those of you who don't know, subject property is the purchasing property on an application, the property you're going to be purchasing. So ideally from a lender standpoint, which is gonna be quite opposite from an investor standpoint, uh, lenders wanna see a lease in place, um, ideally when moving into a property or sorry, when they're purchasing a rental property. Now, obviously from the investor standpoint, a lot of the investors like to have vacant possession. So uh, a little bit opposite views, but uh, there is some ways that we can still use the rental income to be able to uh, qualify on the application. So um, if there is no lease in place, we can use something called the fair market rent value. Um, so it's a market rent letter done from an appraiser. The appraiser will go out, use some comparable values for other homes in that area that you know, are similar type homes, same structures, um, and they'll give us a range of the lower end and to the more maximum end. Um, so the lenders will typically use the lower end of that value. Um, and the downside using the market rent versus a lease is that the market rents are typically a little bit less in value than what yeah. the, the lease is going to be. Despite the name, yes. it's not usually quite at the top of the market. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so something to consider for some A lenders, depending on who you're looking to place your mortgage with, is that they'll only allow you to actually use 65% loan to value um, if you're using a fair market rent report. So, I mean, not all lenders are like that, but some lenders, um, depending on the caliber of lender you're looking to get, will mm -hmm. only allow you to use a certain loan to value for that. So keep that in mind if you're purchasing a property, you might have to put more of a down payment down if you're buying a vacant possession rental right. property. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that just goes to, you know, back to some of our other videos where we've shown a lot of love towards the B lenders. Um, you know, on the B side, if you do have to use market rents, you know, they don't require you to pull back to 65% loan of value. You know, they'll still still do a one to, uh, one to two unit purchase at 80% and uh, some three to four units, sometimes they go to 75%, but still, you know, much better being able to use the market rent and qualify to help on the offset um, than, you know, not using any rent at all. So uh, it's a bit of a win situation for sure to be able to use that. The, the next thing we want to talk about was non-subject properties. So when we talk about non-subject properties, we're explaining uh, the other properties in your portfolio. So not the property that we're specifically focusing on the financing for. So non-subject properties, um, how we look at uh, rental income on that, it really depends on how long you've had the property for. So if you have the property for more than a year, most lenders want to see that you have it on your statement of real estate earnings on your T1 generals. Mm -hmm. It's an easy way for them to verify the costs of the property, so your property taxes, yeah. um, all the maintenance, all that good stuff in there. So it allows them to verify you are telling the truth in regards to the numbers that you're claiming. 
Um, in regards to needing leases in place for less than a year, most uh, lenders want to see at least a lease signed so they can verify it and they might look at bank statements to verify that you've had that consistency in uh, income coming through for those properties. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then just continue on that as well too. Um, depending on, like Josh said, if that lease hasn't been in place yet, but maybe that lease is going into place uh, at some point on a non-subject, uh, typically the lenders will allow you to use the rental uh, income on the lease as long as that lease is going to take effect within the 30 days after closing. Um, so some lenders will allow that and they may want to see a tenant acknowledgement form signed by the tenant as well too. So it's basically just a declaration from the tenant stating that they will be moving into the property and, and paying that set up amount of rent. Um, and then in some cases too, which gets a little bit um, tricky, but sometimes the lenders may want to see a deposit from the tenant as well to. Um, so whether it's a first or a last, um, you know, we can't always expect first month to be deposited before they move in, but mm -hmm. typically some sort of deposit sh uh, structure shown just to show that there is, um, you know, the uh, intent to move in from, from the tenant. Right. And when we're talking about those tenants acknowledgements, it's nothing that complicated, right? Usually like a one page summary, essentially just stating, you know, what your rent is, everything's in good outstanding sign on the dotted line and you're pretty well good, right? That's exactly it, yeah. Simple one page document, uh, signature from the landlord, from the tenant, um, and, and we're all good to go. Awesome. Mm -hmm. um, so the next thing that we wanted to talk about as well too was um, a subject property on a refinance. Whereas maybe a buyer picked up a property and uh, instead of having a tenant in it, they wanted to renovate it right away or do some sort of duplex conversion. So. The lenders sometimes will want to see some sort of rental history if they're going to allow for market rent. Um, so we actually had a client that we were doing a refinance for. They purchased the property, um, they gutted it right away and did a duplex conversion. And the lender gave us a little bit of grief um, trying to use a market rent because there was no rental history uh, in, in place previous. So the owner before it was an owner occupied residence um, and then the new buyers, they hadn't had any leases in place. So um, depending on the lender and a lot of this is very subject to which lender you go to, which is uh, why it can be important to kind of shop around a little bit. Um, some lenders may want there to be a previous history of rental income before they'll allow uh, a market rent letter to be used on a pre-existing property. So that's not going to be for like a, a subject purchase, but for the refinances. Now, in this case, we were able to get an exception done with the lender and they did use a fair market rent uh, to help qualify. Uh, so that's a win, but just something to keep in mind um, when you're moving forward. And especially if you're trying to go the A route uh, through a bank, they might have some problems using a, a market rent if there is no previous uh, history of, of the rent being in place. And then again, continuing with the refinances, if that lease has been in place for one year, um, the standard underwriting guidelines are gonna uh, follow as well too. So they'll wanna see the T1 uh, general showing the rental income and then the uh, statement of, of rentals as well too. Um, and then possibly some uh, you know three or four months history of, of rental deposits again, just. Uh, you know, cementing the fact that they are paying their rent and that it's not just a fictitious lease made up from the uh, from the buyer or from the, the owner. Mm -hmm. Something interesting actually that we had to deal with um, the last little bit was the fact that somebody owned a rental property with another person, so like a, a partner for example, and then they were purchasing another property but by themselves. The lender would only allow them to use 50% of the rental income on the property that they own, but they had to use all of the debts for the property. So there is something to be said about purchasing property with other people and it, how it might affect your application moving forward as well. Yeah, I know from a personal experience that that was actually a major mistake I made with A lenders when I was first building my portfolio. I was buddy, buying student rental properties with two buddies. So there was three of us on title on the first two properties and it became almost impossible to be able to qualify because they would only take a third of the income, but I had 100% of the debt. So again, that's where I was just dealing with a generic employee at the bank. That was my mistake for not taking responsibility. But if you actually sit down with professionals that are gonna think more about more than just this transaction, but how that impacts your future transactions, that's really the value in having someone like on your power team that works with investors on a regular basis.
Mm -hmm. and, and especially important for investors too, because we get a lot of questions about joint venture partnerships and structuring that. And, um, you know, depending on the structure and, and when that possible payout could be, um, you know, if you have somebody else on title with you, you, you may have troubles qualifying moving forward if you're only using half of the rent. So mm -hmm. um, especially on the AAA side, it, it's hard enough to qualify of rental incomes on the AAA because they're only doing the add back and not the offsetting. So, you know, if you're only add, you know, adding back 50%, of your 50%, it's, it's not doing much towards your application to helping you qualify. So definitely, yeah, as you said, sit down and, and make sure we talk that out beforehand and just have some expectations before moving forward. Mm -hmm. For sure. One other thing that we want to talk about too, and I know I've seen some questions in the cash flow um, alpha post is um, assignment of rents. So um, right now with COVID and uh, just in general, uh, from the lender standpoint, reduction of risk is one of their number one things yeah. that they take a look at. Rental assignments is pretty common. And the rental assignment is just basically if the borrower were to go into default on their mortgage, uh, the lender is able to have the rent assigned and uh, start taking that rental income to help supplement their loss. Um, so it's standard practice. And I know I've seen a couple of people, like I said, ask about it. Um, and especially on the commercial side as well too, uh, assignments of rents can be uh, a popular thing requested by the lenders. So one of the things that uh, most lenders will also look at for rental properties is something called a rental reserve. So whether that's a commercial property and they want to see that you have money available to yeah. be able to take care of expenses or just a regular rental property, we're seeing quite a bit of lenders now ask for three to six months of rental um, costs in their bank account to be able to purchase the property because the majority of the deferrals during COVID were specifically people who owned rental properties and the, and it wasn't like their personal residences. So people weren't having problems paying for their houses, having problems paying for the six other houses that they own because people aren't paying them rent, right? Mm -hmm. So they a lot of them have moved into expecting to have at least three to six months of rent in your bank account, or at least to be able to show it in your bank account before closing. Right, and that's in addition to my down payment funds, Correct. right? You know, it's something to be important uh, just to consider. It doesn't necessarily have to be in a checking account. It just has to be from some sort of liquid uh, reserves. Um, so that does mean that it can't come from any RSPs or RESPs, but like I said, TFSAs or some yeah. sort of liquid account, uh, the funds are able to come from there as well. So just some other important aspects that we, you know, we want lenders or borrowers to consider when moving forward. Um, one of them is like what happens if your lease is not in place yet. So like we said, if you're looking to make a purchase and your lease hasn't come into place yet, most lenders will allow you to use that rental income on the lease as long as it is set to go into place uh, within 30 days from the time of closing. Um, and then they will want to see again that tenant agreement form uh, signed by yourself and the tenant and then preferably some sort of last month's deposit just showing that there is that commitment uh, coming from the tenant. So yeah, one of the things we want to talk about really quickly was what happens if I have short-term renters in my uh, yeah. in my house? So Airbnb, for example, guys, it's a great way to make money. It's a really hard way to get financing. Um, there are some creative ways we've seen to be able to do it, but the majority of lenders want to see you have a lease in place for a rental property and you can show consistent income going to your bank account from yeah. the lease. It, it's really important that we look at the full picture as an investor, right? And what the different implications are. We've actually talked about this on some other YouTube videos. So if you guys dive into some of our older Airbnb content, we might actually kind of lay out for you guys, perhaps a path that more lenders will be comfortable with in regards to that. But if you're straight up just renting out your unit on Airbnb and there's no other infrastructure or paperwork structure behind that, it's probably going to be like two years, right? That they're going to want to see a history of or what's been your experience? It, it even, it's even difficult with two years. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of lenders are having a really hard time in general with it, as soon as you say the word Airbnb or short-term gotcha. rentals, yeah. it's basically an instant decline. Gotcha. Yeah, there are ways to obviously do it. As Matt was saying, you know, look at those videos, see how you can structure uh, properly to be able to show income in a certain way. Mm -hmm. And there are ways to get around it. But if you just have an Airbnb rental and you want to refinance or you're, you're, you're going to have an issue. Mm -hmm. Good to know. Yeah. And then continuing on that same type of um, secondary rental properties, student rentals are another issue um, that lenders uh, come across as well too. So, you know, whether you're looking to purchase a property in a major student rental area, so, you know, super close to a university or a college, um, or whether, you know, you're looking to actually purchase a student rental, 
Um, you know, if a lender sees that lease and, and it's got, you know, six, seven, eight kids on there and, and they can tell that it looks like a student uh, lease, you know, they're probably not going to allow you to um, either use that lease to help qualify or they may not even lend on that property to begin with, depending on how close to the area. Um, it could depend on what your goal is. You know, if you're looking to just purchase a home um, or, you know, purchase a rental property, I should say, in an area that is, you know, relatively inundated by other student rentals. If you have some plans, uh, you know, some sort of quote, uh, something that's gonna show that you're maybe changing the, the property to turn it into uh, like a family rental, they may allow that, but it's gonna be pretty heavy work, um, pretty reliant on the, on the paperwork, um, and the chances are still pretty slim that they will either allow you to use that or even put the money out on the property. Right, and then kind of just building upon this entire narrative of Airbnb and students, we're primarily viewing it through the lens of A lenders and like credit unions, right? There's always a private lender out there that can lend to us as long as we've got equity. Of course, yeah, no, as, as long as you have equity, there's always a private lender, alternative lender out there who's going to allow you to do those specific strategies. Mm -hmm. But from an A lender's perspective or a credit union lender's perspective, it's all about risk mitigation, yeah. right? And that's a lot of risk that they're not willing to take. And unfortunately, they have a hard stop for the majority of those uh, investment solutions. Mm -hmm. Yep. Absolutely. Um, and then one other point that we wanted to touch on too is, you know, what happens if my lease was about to expire in the middle of a transaction? Um, so we actually just worked with a client who had their lease um, expire in the middle of a transaction. He already had another lease in place, which hopefully the majority of investors out there are aware of when their leases are in place and when they're going to expire and keeping in track of uh, all the important details. Um, so he was preemptive enough that to had a lease uh, assigned and in place. Um, we were able to get that lease over to the lender, have a tenant acknowledgement form signed and show them the down payment. Um, and the transaction was able to uh, smoothly continue. In the case that you may not uh, have realized your lease was about to expire, um, we would have to talk to the lender uh, to inquire about an exception to be used for fair market rent. Um, and it's just a keynote there. It's important to you know, let your mortgage agent know that if it's about to expire because uh, we may preemptively have to use a fair market rent value ahead of time because of what we're qualifying for and how we submit the application. If we submit an application using uh, rental income from the lease and then we go down to a fair market rent value, there may not be enough offset or extra rent to add back to help qualify. Because um, some of the situations with investors are pretty tight on their debt ratios and a lot of them are relying on the rental income to help qualify. So important to think ahead and, and be aware of when your leases expire. Awesome guys. Well, I really appreciate this. Josh and Aaron dropped a lot of knowledge in this video. So if you guys are interested, we're going to throw a link to all their contact information down below. As always, really encourage you guys, if you're looking to add someone to your power team, why not add these guys, which have been constantly just dropping knowledge on my YouTube channel for, well, it's been months now, every Friday, right? Every Friday is Finance Friday here on Matt's YouTube channel. So anyways, appreciate you guys watching this video. Smash the like button, hit the subscribe button. I'll see you in the next video. That's it for this video. Really appreciate Josh and Aaron just breaking down for us what our lenders want from us when it comes to our leases. And if you guys didn't know, the Finlay team, they're literally gonna be live right this second on their own YouTube channel answering your questions. So if you just watch this video when it dropped because you're on my notification squad, well, you're in for a special treat. Jump over to the Finlay team's mortgage uh, YouTube channel right now. Hit them up with your questions. They'll be answering in real time. And we're thinking about continuing this process. So if you love this idea, jump in the comment section, let us know down below. And also, as always, links to all the guys' contact information in the video description. I'll see you guys in the next video. Smash the like button, hit the subscribe, all that good stuff. Thanks.